Good morning, everyone, or afternoon as the case may be, and welcome to the second in a series of uh, genome technology development webinars sponsored by the TDCC. Uh, I'm Mark Adams. I'm the principal investigator of this grant that is issued from NHGRI. We are a coordinating center that works with genome technology development programs across NHGRI, including sequencing technology development, synthesis technology development, and a broad range of genomic technologies related to understanding the function, structure, and activity of the genome at large scale. We work with over 65 funded programs to enhance coordination and communication, collaboration, and primarily outreach, disseminating the advances from these PIs and their work to the broader scientific community. And today's event is part of that. You can learn more about uh, our group at uh, genometdcc.org. Many of you will have signed up for uh, the whole series. We have four events this May. The next two uh, next week are going to be on single cell analyses and genome scale regulatory analysis. If you're interested in those and haven't signed up, please visit our website, genometdcc.org. With that by way of introduction, uh, today we have a terrific group of speakers in the area of single molecule protein sequencing. This is an area that has really come, come on uh, very strong in terms of a research uh, area in the last few years. I remember when I was in grad school, protein analysis technologies were way ahead of DNA analysis technologies. Uh, I think that's coming uh, back into the fore where it's really important to, if you want to understand the function of a cell to look at its proteins, not just its DNA or its RNA. So let's get started. Our first speaker is Giovanni Maglia. He's a professor at the University of Groningen, uh, uh, Biomolecular Sciences and Biotechnology Institute. As a postdoc, he worked on development of what became the Oxford Nanopore Sequencer, and his group is focused on a wide range of applications of nanopores as sensors and uh, activities in for understanding biology. Uh, Giovanni, take it away. All right, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so I'm very glad to be, to be here to give you this web seminar. So I'm going to talk about single molecule protein sequencing, but I've been asked to give an introduction um, on the field. And then um, uh, the focus of the, of the talk will be to give like a, a brief introduction about the importance of the field and then focus on uh, the few technologies that are actually already on the market or very close to, to be really part of the market and uh, they can already sequence protein at the single molecule level. Um, so um, it is actually a little doubt and that really probably should not tell to this audience that um, the second and third generation or next generation sequencing really has revolutionized the way uh, we see biology. So thanks to this technology, which you can see there here on the left, they really the cost for, for sequencing the human genome is dropping them sort of dramatic sort of way, actually allowed to do certain experiments and understand biology in a way that is really truly revolutionizing. Um, so now the focus is on proteins. Um, and, and, and the reason for proteins is because while DNA is actually a very important molecule, it's really not what is the reality of what we are at the moment right now. So that actually locked into the protein and understanding the protein and the proteome or the, at, the, at, the, at the same level that we understand actually the genome uh, will bring a, an equal revolution in, uh, in biology and, uh, and in medicine. Just to, just to give you a hint, we're gonna have about 90% of the drug targets uh, nowadays are indeed proteins. So proteins great, uh, we know a lot about proteins, but, but actually the proteome is incredibly complex. Um, in fact, um, we don't really uh, understand that much about the proteome. Um, if, you, if you read um, you know, reviews and etc., there are even people that think that um, about 90% of the proteome we don't really see it, and then this, this can be called a dark proteome. So it really depends who you're talking to. Uh, but it, it is actually quite clear that we don't really know the entirety of the proteome. Um, and that's um, kind of like important because um, many diseases that we have, they really require understanding um, the, the full uh, sample of proteins that, that is made um, in cells. Um, one of the reasons why we don't really know much about the proteome is because there's an incredible diversity of proteins. So not only on, uh, on the shapes and, and the size of the protein that's, that's diversity, but also on the chemical composition. Just to give an example from one molecule of DNA that we need to sequence for having the genome and perhaps a few epigenetic modifications, uh, we have about 20,000 genes. 
which the diversity um, of this gene is uh, amplified by the fact that mRNA can be spliced and can be alternative way that we assemble kind of this part of, of the genes. But really the, the, the major kind of variety comes from the fact that we have post modifications, which creates um, some say 1 million, some say 5 million different proteins um, in our protein. So actually try to understand these proteins is really important to understand who we are, how we're made, and actually the, all the pathology that are related to the malfunction of these proteins. Right, so the way that we read proteins nowadays is really using two main techniques. There are other ways, but these are the two main techniques. The one on the left is by, um, if you know what kind of protein you are um, after, then you, there are many kind of antibodies or aptamers or in, in general binders that you can use. And then you can actually make these assays, which uh, right now you actually can um, measure up to almost a million proteins um, in one uh, in one go, in which you can actually use in a fluorescent readout, you can tell you what kind of protein you have in a certain sample. You can go in uh, in real samples, so that's very good. Uh, you can almost do quantification. Um, it's, it actually depends who you're talking to again. Uh, it looks like that different methods actually quantify protein in different ways, so there's some work to do there, but it's very cheap, it's pretty good. Um, the real problem they have this method is that you need to know what kind of protein you need to look after. Um, the uh, the post modifications are difficult uh, to look. You need to have a binder for the specific modification and, and really try to understand the, the, the nitty gritty details between difference between different proteins is really actually quite hard. By far, the, the tool that is used uh, most prominently for uh, the novel sequencing of proteins or discovery of proteins is mass spectrometry. Um, it work, is a, an extremely complicated machine. It's been been in development, development uh, in the last 20 plus year for protein and uh, sequencing and analysis. Um, and now we can you know, measure about um, thousands of proteins in one go. It's pretty good. But the sample preparation is extremely difficult. It requires um, you know, a lot of very skilled uh, people to do that. Uh, not all protein are detected. Here I put 8% of the protein from blood and 30% from cells. This is um, numbers that I get from um, you know, next generation company that want to de you know, displace mass spectrometry, so take it with a pinch of salt. But, you know, it's fair to say that not all the protein can be detected. Um, and, and the reason for that is because you need to first fragment uh, um, proteins into peptides. The peptide need to be um, kind of separated with many different techniques. And a lot of them, they co together. And when you actually go to analyze, because it's an ensemble technique, you actually measure only the most abundant peptide that is co -eluted. Um, at the same time, there's some peptides don't fly very well in mass spec. Some PTMs are not very easy to measure and so on and so forth. There are many kind of um, difficulties that when you use to use mass spec, but although it works very well and pretty much most of the information that we have now is from mass spec. One aspect that I really would like to bring your attention is that um, mass spectrometry to uh, break the protein into peptide to be able to sequence them. And, uh, and that actually lose some information. For example, here, if you have a phosphorylation of a protein in three different parts and some that are actually not phosphorylated, it's really not possible to distinguish if you have these kind of things on the left or actually you have a different kind of combination of phosphorylation if you, if you cannot have intact protein modification. Another example here is a tau proteins that can actually be spliced in many different ways. At least six are known. And then you have more than 70 different uh, phosphorylation sites in this tau protein, and many other can be phosphorylated and have different PTMs. And it's extremely difficult to actually measure this. And, and all these kind of PTMs, protein modification and splicing are related to disease. So it it's, would be very important and very useful if you could have a methodology that can actually sequence and identify protein um, as intact proteins. Um, <clears throat> The way that um, um, I, I can I can explain about these single molecule techniques um, is that the need that you need to you know like that we need to have a why do we need to have a single molecule is because um, mainly protein cannot really be amplified like you do with DNA so you really need to go at the single molecule level if you want to identify the, the heterogeneity that you have in a sample um, the all these techniques they must be a massively parallel because there's a huge different range of concentration of proteins. So you need to really measure 1 million or plus kind of these kind of proteins and better if it's fast. 
You can do de novo sequencing. That's what um, the ideal situation is. But also many techniques just are happy to do ideal fingerprinting of these proteins. Um, as I explained before, it would be great if you can work with intact proteins, but also even fragments would be good because actually can give you all the diversity and the heterogeneity that uh, mass spectrometry at the moment cannot really uh, give you. So in the way that actually to divide it, these different technologies that are popping out more and more, these days, um, there are many different ways that you can uh, catalogize or uh, generalize these kind of proteins. Uh, one way to do it is by the way that actually um, address single amino acids. So um, either you, you need to degrade uh, one amino acid at a time and then address the last amino acid that you are actually cutting off. And that's mainly the uh, technology that are um, more promising and let's say closer to the market. Or actually, you pass one of these molecules across a nanopore, and then you actually measure this amino acid as it pass um, a specific part in the nanopore. Uh, you can also uh, divide them by the readouts. It can be fluorescence. Um, that's the kind of um, um, the, the result of choice for many of these applications, but it could also be an exchange on sequencing, and give an example, or nanopore current. Um, um, I'll, Perhaps the techniques that is uh, uh, more close to the market or one that is actually, in fact, you can already buy right now is a quantum SI um, uh, experiment um, um, device. Um, you can see here um, an example of that is, uh, is this kind of um, um, this kind of like device is basically very similar to what is already in the market for a Pacific bio for what I can understand. Um, I don't really want to kind of say something that's not correct, but for what you can see from, from the paper that they, they published, uh, you have a, a, a waveguide, which is similar to zero more waveguides that Pacific Bioscience has. You have a semiconductor chips with the camera already integrated into the device. And the only difference um, that I can see is that like the, the, the substrate here, which is a, it was a peptide is immobilized, must be immobilized by the C term. Um, and, and you don't really have an enzymatic um, kind of like uh, amplification like in Pacific Bio Science, but you actually have the recognition of the N terminus by um, a, a protein that actually recognizes the N terminus. Uh, the, the, the device is already in the market, I was saying, for less than $1,000, and it can provide a massive readout of millions of, 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 of peptides at the same time. So the recognition um, happens with proteins that actually recognize the N terminus. Uh, this protein is called CLIPS. So the uh, description, the detailed description they're given in their science paper, um, describe you know about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven um, kind of amino acid that can be recognized. The recognition happens either because this um, CLIPS can recognize um, one individual amino acid, or can it recognize a, a family of amino acids, like in this case, um, leucine, as leucine, and valine. And the difference between similar amino acid is actually not only in the color which is attached to the specific um, enzymes that um, measure the N-terminal amino acid, but also by the duration of the poles. Um, so if you have a slightly different energy in the binding of the N-terminus, uh, then you're gonna have a slightly different time that stay bound. Um, then uh, you comes one amino peptidase, which is an enzyme that cut the last amino acid, and then you have that you can access the next amino acid. Um, the, the, the reading time is actually quite long, it's about eight hours. Um, and also here you can see that you can only see certain amino acids. What is blank here is all the one that you can see. Um, in, the, in a deck that they, they, they send uh, for a, um, that you can find on the internet, you can see uh, an update of different families of binders. So now they have about 15 different types of amino acids that can be recognized, that's what they claim. Um, and then you can actually get in closer and closer to actually having a full sequencing of a peptide at the single molecule level. There is another company it's called Encodia, which for what I can see, they are in stealth mode, so it's very difficult to get information. But for what I can see, does exactly the same thing, immobilizes at the C terminus. But here there is a, a piece of DNA that is used as a barcode. And then you, as it there is recognized uh, one amino acid, the terminal, you actually ligate the equivalent piece of DNA to the barcode DNA, then you're gonna have a sequence of DNA here, which is elongated, and then you send it for next generation sequencing, and then you get the sequence of the, of the protein. The advantage is that it's simpler, there is no optoelectronics that is needed and no dyes. Um, that's um, the, the main kind of problems that I can see is could be the mobilization and the slow runtime, but that probably can be, can, can be solved. Full length protein probably cannot be solved because 
only can work with peptide, the structure is going to be a problem. The N-terminal amino acid properly there, they is not clear if they all can be um, identified. And also if you can have um, you know, only one amino acid is identified rather than a group of amino acids that it looks like is the same, at least the last two are identified. And it's not clear if you have enough color for the fluorescence to do real time analysis of, of all of that. There are there are many kind of um, kind of unknown yet, but it's quite impressive. I I, I might say that you can already sequence um, about fifteen amino acids. Um, for a technology that can address a uh, full uh, proteins, I I can select here something that has been uh, uh, described by Nautilus uh, Biotech. They use also affinity sequencing uh, um, antibody aptamer to actually sequence or actually better say identify a full length protein. They have a, a fluorescent readout, and they, again, they have a massively parallel um, readout that they can have. The way that to immobilize is to take a protein, immobilize it by through chemistry into um, a DNA scaffold, and this DNA scaffold is actually uh, lodged into very well-defined spaces into a microchip, and here they claim to have about 10 billions of molecules that can be mobilized and addressed individually. That works again, not like Pacific Bioscience, but as a second generation sequencing technique in which you can actually send one reagent at a time, wash and send, wash and send. And these reagents are uh, antibodies or, or aptamers that can um, bind and recognize a very small, short sequence, amino acid sequence in the full length protein. You do hundreds of different iterative cycles of binding and washing, and eventually you feed it to a machine learning uh, algorithm, and then at the end, you give you the identity of this molecule. So the advantage here, you don't actually cut amino acid by amino acid, you recognize intact proteins, so um, you can address the entire molecule. Well, the claim is that with two or 300 cycles, you have about 90% um, cover of the whole uh, proteasome. In theory, you can actually identify new uh, proteins that are not being characterized before. Um, in practice, their recognition is only 20%. So if you have every epitope that is recognized, if it's present, only one in five is recognized because structure most likely have a part of that. But because you have so many cycles of, of, of uh, washing and, and recognition, then you can end up to actually recognize the full protein. Um, the challenge for this technique probably is that the neighbor residues are going to be influencing the binding. The structure is probably a factor that is there. You cannot really remove and the reagents are a little bit expensive and the runtime is still one day, but probably because you have billions at one time, that's still probably uh, a minor um, problem. Now I leave the, um, the, the, the baton to, to Jeff that's going to talk about um, um, nanopore sequencing and how you can sequence protein with nanopores and, and, um, and thank you very much for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Giovanni. So our next speaker is Jeff Davala, who's a principal investigator at the Molecular Information Systems Lab of the Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering at University of Washington. Uh, uh, Jeff got his uh, PhD as part of one of the uh, biggest nanopore groups uh, at UC Santa Cruz, and did a P uh, postdoc with George Church before joining there. Uh, Jeff, welcome. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, hello, everyone. Nice to be here today. So. Um, as Mark said, I've been uh, working on protein sequencing uh, since I was in uh, grad school, actually, and off and on since then. Uh, and so I lead a group right now where we have a, a big focus is on single molecule protein sequencing with nanopores. And so my goal with the talk today is really to uh, not focus just on the work that, that my lab is doing, uh, but actually try to give you a general overview of sort of the state of the art uh, in uh, nanopore uh, approaches to single molecule protein sequencing. <clears throat> and in only 15 minutes, it, it this will be incomplete. Uh, so I'll just try to give you a flavor of different approaches that, that people are, are, are using to solve these challenges. <clears throat> so Gio Giovanni just gave a great intro great motivation is, as far as why do we need sort of, you know, think of them as next, genera next generation proteomics technologies, orders of magnitude more complex complexity at the proteome compared to the genome, yet the tools that we have to analyze these, uh, uh, it makes it much more challenging. <clears throat> and so uh, I see it sort of twofold uh, where single molecule proteomics can have impacts is it, or the ability to read and sequence proteins, um, not just sort of at the fundamental proteomics side where, you know, you can actually make derive new biological insights as Giovanni was talking about, but also on just sort of general technology side where next gen sequencing has is is used as a readout for all sorts of molecular assays. 
as a way to for different molecular counting applications. And I think if we can extend that to the protein level, we can open up a new swath of, of different different techniques uh, to do to do uh, protein based counting <clears throat> to answer all sorts of questions. And so I'll focus here, of course, now on, on how how are we going to develop nanopore sensors for this sort of next generation proteomics uh, sequencing? So nanopore sensor 101, for folks that are not familiar, how does a nanopore sensor work? So I'm going to be focusing mainly on, on protein-based pores here, uh, which has shown the most promise for, for actual sequencing, and those are what's commercialized in DNA and RNA sequencing devices right now, but they're also another class of solid-state pores. I'm showing you here uh, a protein pore, and the way this works as a sensor, essentially you have your pore embedded within an insulating membrane, you can apply a voltage across that pore, and that drives ionic current flow uh, through that nanopore. And that's what generates your signal. So you can see here, uh, your signal, you know, these are nanometer sized holes. So you're you're driving uh, very, very minute amounts of current measured typically in the in the picoamperes, and you're measuring this over time. And the way that this works as a sensor is when a molecule actually uh, flows through that, uh, a large macromolecule actually flows through that pore, it blocks or occludes some of that current, and essentially that generates your, your signal. Okay, and you also, people in the field also like to maybe call this a squiggle, is, is the way we like to refer to this, um, uh, this type of blockade here. And very early on, this was uh, conceived of as a potential way to do DNA sequencing, where if you could thread a single-stranded uh, uh, piece of DNA through that pore, potentially uh, each base could occlude or block the current in a way that was uh, would allow you to translate its sequence of bases as, as, that, as that strand moves through the pore, uh, map basically that signal into the sequence of, of the nucleotides uh, moving uh, through the pore. Okay, and so very early on it was discovered uh, that if you're just re relying on electrophoresis, right, so one of the nice things about DNA and using nanopores and, and having this electric field being part of your sensor is that you have some ability to, to exert force on charged molecules. So DNA uh, being having that nice net negative charge along the back row, backbone, you're able to electrophoretically force it through a nanopore just, just using that, that electric field. And what you find, though, is if this is not a good approach to actually sequencing a strand of DNA because it moves through the pore uh, much, much too quickly. So showing you down this little plot here, each of these little blips is a, is a long piece of DNA actually moving through the pore, and you really don't have enough uh, resolution in that signal to actually sequence, sequence that strand. So the big breakthrough came about a little over a decade ago. Um, sort of the secret sauce here is, is, is having a motor that can actually control the translocation of that DNA strand through the pore. Let's see. Uh, by using a, a helicase or a polymerase that can ratchet it through the pore base by base, controlling the movement and 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 so using that controlled movement with a uh, a sensitive pore that's a pore that has the right structural dimensions such that it makes it sensitive to single nucleotides uh, along that strand. Putting those two things together sort of made the secret sauce that actually uh, was the first demonstration uh, of of single molecule DNA sequencing. Um, using a nanopore, and it came about this, this collaboration from Mark Akison's lab and Jens Gundlach lab, where Mark had the, uh, the motor and Jens had the nice pore. And so it was a good collaboration to, to bring this together. And essentially now this is a uh, version of this is, has been commercialized now in, in, uh, by Oxford Nanopore Technologies where they have these uh, minion, they're called minion devices, which essentially is a, an array now of hundreds of nanopores that can uh, operating in parallel. Um, and, and the big game changers here is that they deliver, you know, direct single molecule reads. So you're getting base modifications. They can read really long strands, you know, millions of millions of base pairs in a single read. Uh, they give you real-time data streaming and, and they're portable. And they're also scalable. So, you know, more you know, field-based applications, you can have smaller devices with, with less throughput all the way up to, to more genome, genomics uh, size applications, so more like a benchtop type, type sequencer. And they've already led to a number of breakthroughs and, you know, uh, uh, completing the, the human genome, direct RNA sequencing, uh, as well as, as some of the, you know, field-based surveillance and, and, and things of that nature. So, so it'd be great if we could extend some of these features uh, uh, for reading proteins, right? And so if you look at some of the challenges now uh, of protein sequencing, so it's it's the bottom line is really much more difficult for, for a number of reasons to 
to analyze proteins or to sequence proteins uh, with nanopores compared to DNA and RNA. So the first thing we, we can look at is just is just the charge distribution. As, as I was mentioning, DNA and RNA have this nice ne negative charge on the backbone, which gives you sort of a handle on the molecule just by using that electric field. Proteins, on, on the other hand, don't have this, this, net, uh, this net charge along the backbone, so they have more heterogeneously charged. And so it's harder, harder for you to sort of get a handle and thread them through the pore in the first place. And then they also have, <clears throat> right, proteins are folded, so they have this, this tertiary structure that, that you need to somehow deal with uh, to be able to thread them, thread them through the pore, okay? So there's a number of different approaches that, that people have been looking at over the last decade or so of how do we get, how do we thread, pro, th linearly thread these, these proteins through the pore? So on the left is sort of this general class of, of using um, uh, basically chemical methods uh, similar to, to uh, um, how you might thread uh, DNA through the pore, which is if you can essentially attach the charge tethered to, to one end of the protein, let's say an oligonucleotide or a charged peptide, uh, it sort of gives you a handle to then be able to uh, hopefully pull that whole molecule, then uh, unfold it and pull it through the pore. So this is sort of this non-enzymatic non, non control. And on the right side are, are showing you two different approaches. We're actually using molecular motors, similar to how you might sequence DNA. Uh, we're able to use that molecular motor uh, to actually ratchet strand, uh, full-length proteins or, or peptides through the pore. <clears throat> so I'll walk you through some different examples of, of, of these approaches. So I'll start off here with this non-enzymatic control here. Um, so this was first demonstrated uh, about 10 years ago out of uh, Hagen Bailey's lab, where they attached onto the N terminal of the of the protein. Uh, they actually attached a DNA oligonucleotide, and what this allowed them to do is actually pull uh, single protein molecules into a pore uh, with electrophoretic force. Okay, and when this happens, basically the the protein will will become captured at the uh, at the top of the pore, and then it will unfold, and then it will eventually unfold under underneath that electrophoretic force, where essentially there's this uh, uh, by mechanically pulling on the end of that protein. And what they're able to observe is is really interesting. Basically, this co co uh, translocational unfolding of the protein, and, and observe different unfolding intermediates as that protein went through the pore. Okay. So it was really interesting way to sort of examine different unfolding states, uh, but it really didn't give you much control of the translocation process or the speed. So as far as the sequencing approach, uh, it didn't quite uh, uh, hit the mark for them. Um, more recent work, actually just a few months ago out of many Wanunu's lab is using a similar approach uh, where he's attaching a charged tether uh, to the end of the protein. In this case, it's actually a, a charged peptide molecule. Okay, And then in the buffer, he's put guanidinium chloride, and it essentially gets rid of all the folded structure of the protein such that now you can electrophoretically thread that protein through the pore and actually get uh, a full length translocation of that protein uh, through the pore without having to deal with any of that uh, folded structure. And so what they're able to show is actually sort of you're getting a, a coarse grain view of this protein as it moves through the pore. It's still going through very, very, very fast. So each of these little spikes, excuse me, in the signal here is actually uh, hundreds of amino acids going through the pore at a time. And so uh, uh, it, this method was really good at sort of driving full length translocation of the, pro, of the proteins through the pore, but it sort of lacks that sequence sensitivity uh, uh, to actually get towards, towards a sequencing approach. But, but they were able to demonstrate sort of this coarse grained view where you can get some idea of the shape of a protein that, that you have some uh, ability to, to identify or distinguish between different, different types of proteins. <clears throat> okay. So moving now towards the uh, enzymatic based control. So getting, uh, in my view, a little bit more closer to, to actually sequencing and, 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 and some of the tools that we'll need to, um, uh, uh, to continue to develop uh, to actually get to more single amino acid uh, sensitivity. And so the first route here is actually using a, a DNA based motor to, to pull peptides uh, uh, through a pore. Okay, and so this, so there's a series of papers that came out in, in 2021 from the uh, Huang lab, uh, Bay lab, and Case Decker's lab, all showing generally the same technique, where essentially what they did, they take peptides and they can conjugate um, a, a, a DNA oligo to them, 
And then they can use a, a, a DNA process of motor, just like you would use in DNA sequencing, so either a helicase or a polymerase, okay? And you can use that to ratchet both the DNA strand that the helicase or the polymerase is operating on. And, and as that is ratcheted through the pore, you're also going to uh, pull along the peptide along with it, okay? And that, using this approach, you're actually able to get um, single amino acid resolution uh, in a very controllable way. So I'm showing you traces here. So this is the raw data here, and this sort of a translated to a, to a sequence map where you're, first you're, the process starts out, you're actually sequencing that, that oligo tether, then eventually that peptide will come up uh, through the pore and you actually, your current changes are actually now uh, um, um, dependent upon the sequence of that peptide. And they're able to show, at least in, in, in the Decker paper, that they're able to distinguish with high accuracy between a, a small subset of different amino acids. Um, and, and I think the really cool uh, um, aspect of this that was in the um, Brinkerhoff um, and Decker paper was they're actually able to show rereading the same molecule many times, because as that helicase is, is, is ratcheting along that oligo, when it reaches that peptide, it'll slip off and you can have another motor loaded, already loaded on the, on the oligo. And so essentially your read will slip back uh, to the previous position. Um, where where that where that other helicase is bound and, and doing this you can actually reread the same molecule many many times and really increase your single molecule sequencing accuracy which i think will be rereading will be really key for for nanopore based um, single molecule protein sequencing <clears throat> and so some of the limitations to this right is that we're not dealing with with full length proteins uh uh so we're still reading uh, uh peptides here and so this Basically, your read length is limited between the distance uh, between that nanopore sensing constriction and the top of the pore. So in their case, it's around 20 amino acids. And the sequences that, that they showed that this worked for were, were highly negatively charged, so, so really amenable to sequencing in this method. So it, it, it remains to be seen how well this will, this will generalize to, to neutral or, or positively charged, charged peptides, but, but a super, super promising start here. Um, and actually, last summer, uh, Oxford Nanopore showed some data at their conference where they're actually uh, uh, exploring a similar approach uh, to, uh, to peptide sequencing using a DNA motor as well. So I think that's going to be a really, really active area uh, uh, um, um, for commercialization fairly soon. Um, okay, so that's with the enzymatic or, or DNA-based motors. And so now we'll get to my favorite, my favorite form of, of, of uh, approach to nanopore protein sequencing, and that's using uh, a protein process of motors or specifically unfoldase motors to, to pull proteins through the pore. Okay, so what is, what's an unfoldase? So essentially an unfoldase is an ATP powered protein unfolding machine. Uh, so there's basically they, they function in the cell to grab onto protein substrates, unfold them, and then degrade them. So, so involved in, in protein turnover. Uh, and so Ones from E. coli, are, are a common one is CLIP-XP. Uh, eukaryotes have a version called 26, the 26S proteasome. And so the question is, uh, how do you un un uh, uh, sort of couple this unfoldase activity uh, uh, to a nanopore sensor? And so there are actually various ways you could do that. Um, so I'm showing you work here from actually from Giovanni's lab, <clears throat> where he uh, made this, engineered this um, proteasome nanopore fusion, where you actually had take this protein protein nanopore, and you make a fusion protein such that you put a binding site for the proteasome on, on top of it. And what that allows you to do is actually un, uh, assemble this whole, this whole proteasome complex and the unfoldase on top of the pore, show, uh, as it's shown here. And what you're able to do then is capture proteins in solution and then push them down, uh, down into the pore for, for analysis and actually do this in two modes. So if you have this, uh, the, the, the proteolytic activity of the, of the protein is, is knocked out, uh, you actually thread and read entire full length proteins, or you can have that protease activity turned on and you actually end up what they call a chop and drop, where you're actually chopping up the proteins as it's not, before they're actually threaded uh, uh, down into the pores to actually start to get uh, reading individual, individual peptides using, using that method. Um, so, so really, really cool engineering feat here, um, uh, and and it, and it sort of remains to be seen the ability to distinguish between different different proteins using this method, uh, uh, and and you know how how single single amino acid level sensitivity uh, uh, will be achieved using this, um, but a really interesting approach to to coupling this unfoldase activity to the pore. Um, so when I was in grad school, I developed this alternative approach where you actually have the, these unfoldase motors in the trans side solution. 
um, and then you initially thread a protein substrate through the pore using that charged tether, uh, but it gets stuck until that 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 protein uh, that unfoldase that's present in the trans solution is actually able to grab onto it and then mechanically pull uh, that protein uh, uh, through the pore as shown in this, this little video here. And what we're able to show, we, we weren't using a very sensitive pore, but what we're able to show is sort of a coarse grain uh, sequence level view that could allow us to discriminate uh, against some subset of proteins. And also using this method, you get some ability to get information built, both about the stability um, because of how long it takes to unfold, um, as well as the size of different protein domains based on how long it takes to translocate. And this is sort of a method that we've picked up now in my own lab, but we sort of adapt it to now the motor's not in the trans side, it's actually in the cis side. Okay, so you initially uh, 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 thread the protein through the pore using that charged tether. It gets stuck because we have this blocking domain, and then we load the enfoldase in and it pulls that protein back out of the pore. Okay, and what this is nice, it's completely cis side only. Uh, so this makes it compatible with the commercialized nanopore devices like Oxford Nanopore's Minion Array that we're using to develop this approach. And what we've been able to show is actually a single amino acid level sensitivity, uh, though albeit in sort of this synthetic synthetic context right now, but it, what it's allowing us to do is sort of get a handle of on sensitivity and, and, and how different amino acids uh, uh, um, um, contribute to, to our protein-based signals. <clears throat> okay, so this is, this is really exciting work that we're really uh, 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 pushing on right now. And so there's a lot of exciting results uh, uh, that will be coming coming on that. So stay tuned. Um, okay. And finally, I'll just wrap up here. I didn't mention anything about signal analysis, right? I'm just was really focused on sort of the mechanics of how do you get a protein through the pore. So one of the main challenges in, in, in sequencing is how do you how do you sort of translate this this noisy signal and actually sequences of, of bases? And so early DNA sequencing is using you know hit Markov models and, and, and lookup tables where now state of the art uh, base collars are, are really using these machine learning approaches. And I think these deep learning, same deep learning approaches will really be key to, to protein sequencing as well. But first, we really need a robust re reproducible system that works on a wide variety of protein and peptide sequences. Uh, and, and if you can get data at high enough throughput, I think I think this ML magic will be able to 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 be able to do some useful decoding there. Um, but but as Giovanni said, protein sequencing you know can be reduced to a lookup problem. So I think that will be much much will come much sooner. Uh, we're essentially using a protein fingerprint printing approach um, for nanopore based uh, sequencing, and and I think even sequencing synthetic proteins will have their uh, will have their applications. As I said, for things like like barcoding. And with that, I'd like to uh, yeah just acknowledge all the folks in my lab and 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 thank Mark again for the opportunity. Great. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Jag uh, Swaminathan from uh, uh, Arisian, which uh, Giovanni alluded to. He's the founder uh, founder and chief technology officer. Um, before that, he was a PhD and postdoc at UT Austin. I'm going to talk about a different technology for single molecule protein sequencing. Uh, Jag, it's all over to you. Yeah, thank you, Mark, and the organization committee for the kind invite to speak at the TBCC virtual seminar series. I'm really excited about the field. As you can say, I've been at this field for about a decade, uh, starting with my PhD, and now I'm uh, leading the effort at Erision to commercialize the technology. Um, you guys have heard about uh, all these new uh, emerging field from the previous two speakers and, uh, and the incredible challenges that they had to encounter. Uh, I've been given a little mandate in this talk to try to peel back the layers and ask what is the single molecule technologies really going to be good for? Like, as you all know, uh, invention, uh, necessity is the mother of all invention. So I want to lo uh, look at it and um, make you guys also reflect on like what this technologies could be helpful for. So uh, I've just outlined this talk. Uh, I'll be going over uh, a few uh, thoughts on how to think about the applications. And then uh, I, have, I will speak two of the very uh, interesting applications that we are working on. And to do that, I have to give you a short primer on how our technology works. And then finally, I'll summarize with what I think the, the next needs for the field are. So, um, uh, but before I do that, I just want to acknowledge every single person in our team, both at UT and Erision. Uh, we were founded in March of 2018, and uh, we are uh, commercializing the instrumentation, and uh, we want to have a, a, a 
uh, set the field up for very new and exciting applications. Um, so uh, I don't have to tell you guys why, why proteomics is important, but I just want you to, to reflect on the fact that uh, the central question in most proteomics research is the following. Which proteins are present in my sample and at what counts are they present or what is the concentration at, at which it is present? Uh, these are information that, as you can think about, cannot be got from DNA sequencing technology. So you cannot identify post-translation modification that appear in uh, disease, uh, disease samples or a very uh, sensitive detection of antigenic peptides for cancer therapy. Um, the uh, before I launch into uh, the different applications, there is there is one thing that I want you all to keep in mind when you think about why proteomics is very much challenging than DNA sequencing. And I kind of like laid out uh, a little uh, comparison, and you can see that we unfortunately don't have polymerases. There are plenty of diversity of the amino acids and hundreds of post-translation modifications that happen. There are two critical aspects of why proteomics uh, remain to be a very challenging area of research. And that is due to the vagaries of solubility of the proteins. They have uh, littered with different types of charged molecules. They have differences in uh, 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 solubility in different solvents. And you tend to end up with loss of, uh, of samples as you transfer them from your tissue to your instrument. And uh, dealing with that uh, is, is really a big problem in proteomic research. Uh, the second uh, biggest challenge is the wide dynamic range that we have to deal with when compared to the RNA sequencing. Uh, a blood, single blood samples could have proteins ranging in abundances from uh, across 10 to the power of 11 to 10 to the power of 12 molecules. And even a single cell is estimated to have uh, a billion order of uh, magnitude of protein concentration differences. Um, what I, uh, oops, um, so what I uh, try to uh, frame this application space is to uh, break up the technology features into three different components. One is the sensitivity, that is how many molecules of the proteins can you identify? The second is the coverage question. In my sample, what is the number of proteins that I can identify? and like different types of proteins. So uh, in a human sample, you're estimated to have at least 20,000 proteins and can you identify them all? And the third, uh, and the third dimension, which is sometimes not uh, uh, well understood is what I call as the quantitative range. So what this is, is uh, it's, uh, uh, it is the estimation of the dynamic range of a proteoform. So people also call these a stoichiometry of uh, modification. So for every 100 proteins, how many of my proteins was modified with a phosphorylation? So this kind of stoichiometry is what uh, is dynamic and, and oftentimes a disease indicator. Um, layering on to, and you can see in from this chart that mass spectrometry does a fantastic job of covering a large swath of uh, features. It is it can, as, as was alluded, there are studies that say we can get to uh, lower uh, femtomole to uh, upper atomole levels of sensitivity, and you can detect more than 10,000 proteins from, uh, uh, from wide fractionations. But then there is a limitation in terms of quantitation. So you uh, find it difficult to measure the percentage of phosphorylated residue on your favorite protein of interest to the total proteins that is present. So as you can see, there is a large swath of uh, space to play with. And my speculation is that a lot of these technologies like the full length nanopore technologies that was described earlier or the Nautilus approaches or the shot shotgun methods, they have a place in this application. And we'll have, and uh, we might find different uh, technologies applying different applications. Um, you can think about some of the interesting ones like the single cell proteomics, which has been a big challenge for the mass spectrometry field. And, uh, and just like how single cell RNA sequencing revolutionized a lot of uh, medical research, we can think about uh, single cell proteomics doing a similar job. 
Uh, purity of biologics is one other thought that I had, which is that if you have an glycosylated antibody that you have produced, how pure is it in your sample? And now we're not talking about impurities from other proteins. We're actually talking whether the exact same patterns of glycosylation was found in every single uh, biological molecule that you're going to inject into a patient sample. So these are the kind of uh, questions that uh, uh, are currently not tenable to be answered by any of the antibody-based methods or mass spectrometry. Um, I will be talking about two methods that we have focused on in our work, which is the detection of uh, antigenic or the HLA peptides uh, from cells and the determination of uh, mapping the sites of phosphorylation and the stoichiometry of them. Um, so before I give you that, I want to give you a quick, very quick preview of what floral sequencing technology is so that you can look at the data in a different light. Uh, our central concept is that if you know the positional information of a select few amino acid residues, that is sufficient to infer who the protein is. So in this uh, case, if you know the database, which is seldom overdetermined by the genomic and the transcriptomic information. So as it was alluded to before, oftentimes it's just a lookup problem. Um, and, to, and it turns out that four different amino acid types uh, and knowing the position of the protease is often sufficient to make an inference of who the protein is. Uh, what we have done is we assembled uh, a technology to piece, to get this positional information together. And so what I'm going to show you is a short video of uh, us uh, talking uh, of, of the description of the technology. So we take salts, we take the proteins, extract out the proteins, digest them into peptides, just like how you would do in a traditional mass spectrometry experiment. Uh, these peptides are then selectively labeled. So the amino acid side chains go through a covalent chemistry of attaching fluorophores to it. And since there is a lot of work that has been in, done in bioconjugation methods, we have distinct chemistries to label lysines, cysteines, tryptophan, tyrosines, and a number of different amino acids. We immobilize these peptides on a glass slide, and now we end up with millions of these individual spots, uh, fluorescent spots. They look like stars on a dark night. And we take measurements of intensities of these peptides across all the different channels. We then perform Edmund degradation chemistry, which is a classic chemistry of the 1950s, where you cut one amino acid at a time from the end terminus, leaving the rest of the peptide backbone intact. So what comes out is that every single spot on this billions of peptide molecules gets a partial sequence of who the position of the different amino acids are. And if there is no change, there is marked as an X and we move on. And this pattern, which we call the floral sequence, is used to match to a reference database to infer who it is. Um, we can do a similar uh, modifications of these fluorophores, but we can also modify the, um, uh, the side chains of post-translation or modified residues. So in this case, we teach how to modify the phosphorylated residues and attach a fluorophore on the sites of phosphorylated serine sathrionids. So and what you can see here are the counts of molecules with the phosphorylated signal at the distinct position where it was labeled. So this gives us uh, the two important types of information. One is the position of the modification, and second, the concentration at which this modification occurred in the sample. Uh, a very quick overview of how we look at the data. In this example, we have a peptide, a full peptide mixture labeled with different uh, types of fluorophores to two different types of fluorophores, labeling the lysines and the cysteines. And, uh, and then we perform fluoro sequencing experiment. And here you see some of the raw data where you see the drops of intensities corresponding to the different channels at which it uh, uh, at which the fluorophores were labeled. And this gives us a pattern which is completely different from the next spot on our flow cell. Um, what comes out from this and uh, applying a number of machine learning algorithms to solve for image correction and image analysis and a protein inference uh, question, we end up with um, uh, a machine learning algorithm that can score our fluoro sequencing reads to the different, um, uh, to the different peptides. 
And here you see a classic UMAP plot, which, uh, did, uh, which distinguishes the four different peptides that we had in our sample. Um, now I want to uh, shift gears. Now that you have a flavor for our technology, I want to shift gears to talk about two applications that I alluded to before. So the first is the neoantigen. You may have seen uh, a recent article from the uh, New York Times, which talked about this incredible clinical uh, uh, therapy for prostate cancer where spiking uh, the um, a vaccine, a cancer vaccine, actually helped clear out this tumor. So there's a lot of... Uh, uh, effort in this field to develop these cancer vaccines where knowing a few uh, uh, peptides on the surface of proteins is sufficient to make an inference of who they, uh, of uh, determining these cancer vaccines. Turns out that mass spectrometry is extremely challenging to uh, get to the sensitivity. And so we are left with uh, the DNA, DNA sequencing information where we predict what are the HLA peptides that are expressed on the uh, cells of these proteins and we make an estimation from them. What we did is we took this information uh, of the genomic uh, predictive power and layered on top of it with mass spectrometry by characterizing a monocell allelic cell line B cell, B cell line, which produce these HLA peptides. And it turns out that um, the, there is very small overlap between what is predicted by DNA and what comes out from actual detection of peptides. So there's a huge gap to be solved. We applied this to our method and spiked and did, wanted to determine the recovery of this uh, peptides in, in the complex mixture. And it turns out that the sensitivity is where we uh, where we really can uh, address. And this is where I think one of, the uh, one of the applications of our field could be. And now we could layer this top on top of DNA information and we have more confirmation of the target antigenic peptides. All right, one uh, more minute. Uh, I just want to quickly point out that the phosphorylations is always a challenge. It has always plagued the field of mass spectrometry given the limited amounts of phosphorylation events, the poor ionizability and the inconclusive peptide identification uh, problem. And we uh, tackled this through uh, recombinant proteins that were in vitro phosphorylated and compared them to mass spectrometry. And I just want to take, uh, uh, want you to take home this message that uh, single molecule resolutions provide for a much more highly resolved digital counts of these phosphorylated molecules. And we can measure multiple different uh, uh, sites of phosphorylation that comes out from it. All right, um, that's my time. So I just want you to leave back with, uh, with, with this summary that uh, there is a new technology uh, in the field of, uh, which is the single molecule protein sequencing that can be helped to address a range of new applications uh, and uh, want you to think more about some of the needs and challenges that can encounter. Three different considerations that we need to overcome is to address the huge dynamic of range of protein abundances in any sample, uh, especially because we lack the LC and the electrospray that is there in mass spec, uh, a method to avoid sample losses during sample preparation, and finally think about the sampling biases we get when we try to account for low concentration of analyte to be observed. With that, I will, um, I will leave, uh, give back control to the host. All right, thank you very much, Jag. Actually, uh, I'm gonna take these out of order just a little bit, a couple of questions come in. The first one going to you, which is, um, uh, how many rounds can you read through Edmund degradation and, and um, do you have to worry about photo bleaching uh, for the for imaging, uh, great question. Uh, so we actually routinely perform Edmund chemistry for about fifteen rounds without a hiccup. And at single molecule level, the question becomes very interesting, which is that it is now a binary decision that every peptide molecule plays, whether to Edmund or not to Edmund. And so what we end up is a phasing difference. So there are some population of molecules that just shift, and this. We adopt borrowed techniques from uh, DNA sequencing and call this an insertion error. And so we have developed a top-down uh, model for uh, estimating all the different parameters, including photo bleaching, uh, 
uh, which turns out to be the least of our problems, but uh, it does occur at a particular rate and we select for fluorophores that uh, survive those. And uh, and then there are other parameters that play in the uh, play right. in the game, and, and we model them all upfront. And how many peptides does the does the chip uh, permit analysis of at the same time? So it's all a question of real estate. The longer you want to image, the more number of reads. Our flow cell, uh, which is uh, roughly the size of a regular uh, slide, uh, is uh, takes somewhere about. 250 million spots. Uh, this is, uh, and, and then there's filtration. So there is a, yeah. But you know, every yeah. cell has 10 to the power of nine proteins. So yes. uh, we have to think of that as one of the limitations too. Great, thank you. Jeff, we're gonna switch over to you. Um, one question about, uh, do you need to break disulfide bonds, generally speaking, for doing analysis in nanopores? And a second question about, uh, distinguishing between similar amino acids like lysine and arginine, um, what, what's going to what's it going to take to improve that kind of discrimination at the current level? And do you think yeah. you can do that from software, or is that going to have to be biochemistry as well? Yeah, uh, yeah. So for the first question, uh, definitely we can do it. We do do a reduction step to reduce the disulfide bonds, and so we don't have to do, uh, deal with those covalent linkages that would presumably uh, could clog the pore with a narrow enough pores that we're that we're using. Um, and as far as discrimination between similarly charged or similar uh, amino acids, um, so definitely similar amino acids with similar similar chemical properties will give you similar signals. Uh, but in the majority of cases, we are still able to to resolve uh, uh, between these subtle differences. Let's say between DNA, &E, K, and R. So I think a lot of it comes from software. Uh, uh, so I do think we'll be able to discriminate amongst those, uh, but of course there are different chemical tricks that you could do uh, if if you want to resort to labeling, um, and and you could imagine more of a fingerprinting based approach uh, could it, could increase your resolution there for particular amino acids. Right, and I, I think perhaps related to this, and I, there was uh, a question. Do you, I saw you and Giovanni were going back in the chat that our attendees couldn't see. Maybe you could mm -hmm. talk a little bit about the the. Clipex uh, stepping, using that as a motor, and yep. sort of some of the advantages and disadvantages of that, and and whether uh, I, I see you're looking at other motors. What what do you look for when you're trying to control this process of passing a protein through a pore? Yeah, yeah. So one thing that you want is a really consistent. What you'd like is a consistent uh, step size. So Clipex steps in a one nanometer distance, so it doesn't step in a particular number of amino acids. So it, it steps a particular uh, a, a physical distance, and and the, why is the, this is a challenge? Because that could be a variable number of amino acids for each step, depending on the backbone conformation of that substrate protein as it's threading through the pore. So that would not be ideal because it sort of complicates your signal analysis. Because every time you see a change in in the current in your ionic current, it could have you could have passed a variable number of amino acids, maybe maybe five, maybe eight, maybe ten in that single step. So it definitely complicates um, from a sequencing approach, it complicates your analysis. So, so what we're looking at is alternative motors that perhaps step in units of amino acids. And there's different uh, uh, sort of active field of research as far as the biophysics is concerned, where, where people are, are trying to, to uh, uh, determine how different motors step along proteins. And there's some classes of unfoldase where they think they actually, some type might actually step in units of amino acids as opposed to distances. And so we're looking at looking at those as well. All right. And then um, ba back to this is a since we only have a minute left prognostication question. Uh, I thought it was cool that you're building on top of the ONT platform. Of course, there's lots of different pieces to all of these technologies, right? There's um, you know, even in the nanopore space, there's lots of different pieces. Uh, you know, software might be generalizable, but only in the context of a certain hardware, et cetera. When will a nanopore protein sequencer be on the market? Uh, I wouldn't want to speak for ONT, uh, but I will say a lot of, uh, my, from my perspective, a lot of the time that it took ONT to get that platform to market was, as you mentioned, Mark, that hardware and getting getting a system where you could reproducibly and robustly have a, a platform where you can collect data from hundreds of nanopore sensors. And so now that I think those platforms are established, that might have been one of the hardest parts. And now that you know you have those platforms out there, it would be relatively simple to to translate a, a, a protein analysis system to those platforms. And as 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 we're doing right now. 
Well, one of the things that's really exciting to me about this area, and I think you guys captured this as well, is there's so many different technological approaches that are being applied. Uh, Jag, thanks for telling us about Arisian's approach and Giovanni for walking us through quantum psi and Nautilus, some of the things that you're doing. Um, it's the, they're, they're, the, the protein analysis space is huge. The technologies are really interesting and really looking forward to seeing how these things are used in the coming years. Thanks to each of you for presenting today and for your perspectives, really appreciate it. For those of you who didn't have a chance to get your question answered, please feel free to email us tdcc at jax.org, tdcc at jax.org, and we'll pass those along to the panelists. Uh, we'll have these videos available on our YouTube channel, Genome TDCC. Take a look out for that and for those from the others in the series. Look forward to hopefully seeing some of you next week at our other events. Thanks for joining us today. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.